What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. Alright, so today we're just reading one story, and it's a really, really, really long one, and it's called Escaping a Hostile Work Environment by the Book. My story starts off as mundane as anybody's. Five years into working for an enormous corporation, my group was reorged. This particular reorganization was, like most efforts, a half-baked idea ginned up by a suit in a corner office, questionably planned, poorly executed, and terribly communicated. Nonetheless, I was sent from my old group to a brand new, to me, group managed by Jim. Halpert? <laughs> Jim seemed an okay fella, with a dry sense of humor and a British accent that lulled me into thinking he was a decent guy. Working for Jim was okay. He was never available, and when we did meet maybe once a month, he'd bark off a list of things for me to do, then say he had a conflict and had to go to another call. I was floundering a little, but felt I had a handle on things. During my first annual review via phone, Jim offered up the vanilla platitudes about how things were going well, while I heard him distractedly typing away at IMs from people pinking him. He paused when he got to my salary and hedged a bit. Ah, so I got you a small increase. I couldn't get you much. To be frank, I'm not going to question how anyone arrives at their salary level, but you make way more than the other people on my team. It was awkward, but not the first time I've had such a pointed salary discussion with a male manager. It's never been a talking point with any of the women who managed me, and I wondered if he would have made those comments to me if I were a man. I've managed teams over the years, and noticed the women on my team seem to make less than their male counterparts. So, I get I'm an anomaly, but I'm a high performer in a 25-year uninterrupted career, as I never chose to have children. I've worked hard for my salary, and I'm proud of it. I could get hired elsewhere at this salary in my market easily given my experience, qualifications, and certifications. Shortly after our review, Jim moved on to work with my primary group of business partners, leaving me with no manager, just a two-up manager I'd never met or spoken to. And that's when the dookie hit the fan. Unbeknownst to me at the time, my salary was brought up in a discussion with his new team. The fine ladies who were managers of the teams I worked with in my business partner group. As it's been relayed to me, Jim didn't blurt out the specific details, of course, but when one of the women complained about something I'd done, Jim said he was surprised there were issues because I was the highest paid person on his now former team. He poisoned the well quite nicely for me. Going back through my emails, I could pinpoint the date and time the remark was said, because the tone of every single one of those managers changed as if on a dime. If I asked a question, I was berated because you're our most senior analyst, you should know that. Documentation that had sufficed before was suddenly all wrong. There were two particularly hostile culprits. Pat, who managed reporting on the systems we were migrating, and her underling project manager, Wanda. Pat came at me quick, fangs bared, with a demand that I put together a plan to get us to the next generation of reporting, which wasn't due to be released until 2021. The 2021 plan Wanda her project manager had put together, looked like notes on a greasy cocktail napkin. So Pat decided that since I was the SME, what? I should do Wanda's work for her instead. Pat wanted a plan from today, in 2019, through to the date of release in May 2021. According to her, it had to include all the tasks needed for delivery right from the start, which is not how planning works. I can't predict the future, so my plans usually usually start out detailed in the near term, with increasingly wider swaths of more generalized tasks to be elaborated in detail as we get further along. This is an industry standard approach and was never a problem right up until it was. Pat started hounding me relentlessly to get this full plan done for her in five days, which would have been an impossible task under the best of circumstances. Nonetheless, I put together a 2,000 line long plan, working even and over the weekend because my arms had been in 
pain for several months from typing at my home office, and I had to take frequent breaks from the pain. Note, I had been a remote employee against my will, and when I was reorganized, I started asking for a desk back at work. Jim always dismissed my requests, saying there was no space. So I spent over $1,500 on an ergonomic chair and desk for my home to make typing easier. But my arms still hurt any time I sit at the keyboard for more than half an hour. I had to back burner my more immediate pressing work for upcoming releases in the next couple of months, because Pat told me I had to prioritize her work over everything else. I had no manager to help redirect my priorities back to my other work, and when I tried to say it would have to wait until after I finished my more pressing work, Pat sighed and bitterly said in front of a half a dozen people, including Wanda, <sighs> So you're our most senior SME, and you're telling me you can't do the work? Pat then decided to up the ante by insisting I run every element of the plan I was creating for Wanda by Wanda. A junior level project manager who not only didn't understand the systems we were using, I had to tell her how to create her own status reports, but wrote at a third grade level. Even subject verb agreement is out of Wanda's grasp but she had a chip on her shoulder and now she believed she could tell me what to do and how to do it. It was like a teacup poodle trying to guide a Rottweiler. Wanda was immediately and clearly out of her element, and obviously so. As a result, every single time she was caught screwing up, she threw me right under the bus. She'd preemptively throw me under the bus too. Wanda's only talent was deflecting blame and painting herself as the victim. I did didn't know what to do. I was having anxiety attacks. My heart would start racing to 145 beats per minute on the couch at night when I started thinking about work. I was overwhelmed and my arms were killing me. And then the unthinkable happened. My mom suddenly died. When I told the team, they were not only completely unsympathetic, they were pissed. I had to take a week of bereavement. And this too pissed them off as I was leaving the day before the deadline Pat had given me to finish Wanda's plan for the 2021 project. Instead of packing for the funeral or connecting with my family, I spent the three days before my leave working late nights trying to finish the plan. We met at 5 p.m. the day before I was to go on leave, where Pat and Wanda ripped into my plan and said they would work with another team member to fix all of my mistakes in the week I was gone. Finally free of the evil twins, I went on leave, and while on leave, my arms stopped hurting. After six weeks of physical therapy for my arm problems, just not typing for a while helped immensely. I had two days left before I had to go back to the hellhole, and I was dreading it. When the heart palpitations started up again, I knew I couldn't go back. At first, I decided I would just quit the day I was supposed to return. I didn't want to even give them two weeks notice. I hated them so much. Much. They had been so cruel about me taking bereavement leave. I wanted to screw them over, good and proper. No two weeks notice meant I'd leave them hanging for their near-term releases that I'd not been allowed to finish up my work for, as well as for the 2021 plan. And if I burned a bridge or my reputation, so what? I'm nearing the age where people usually retire or have a major career change. I don't need to keep that bridge any longer. I have saved up enough and damn it, my health was more important to me than these toxic people or my paycheck. The night I decided to quit, I went to sleep relieved and not anxious for the first time in six months. I felt my anxiety leaving me, knowing I wouldn't have to work with those people ever again. It felt like a solid plan. Then the next morning, I woke up with a plan even more brilliant. It checked all my boxes. I wouldn't have to go back to work. I wouldn't have to to give two weeks notice so they'd still be screwed, I would still get paid, and I would be able to take care of my arms that have been in pain for so long. And while I'm at it, manage the anxiety that had spiraled out of control because of my hostile co-workers. My new and improved plan was simple. Take medical leave. I needed protected medical leave in the form of FMLA, which, for those not in the US, provides up to 12 weeks of leave where my specific specific job role and salary must be
be protected and available to me upon my return. And because it was medical leave, I was automatically enrolled in short-term disability, for which my company will pay 100% of my salary for 8 weeks and then 65% of my salary for the remaining weeks I'm out. The best part of this plan is it screws over all the people I want to screw over and it's all 100% legit. I had been having problems keeping up at work because of all the doctor's visits I had for my arms, physical therapy, and regular therapy for my anxiety that had gotten out of control, and a psychiatrist. My health issues were eating into my workday, causing me to have to work early mornings, nights, and weekends more than ever, and no doubt pissing off these people who thought I was making too much money to be deserving of any time off for doctor's appointments. My team got a new manager after six weeks coincidentally just the day before I was to come back from bereavement. I was sneakily logged on to work every day to catch his name, and I stealthily dialed into the conference call where he was introduced to the team. My two-up manager that I'd never spoken to even said at the outset, I think we have everyone on the bridge. OP won't be here, she's on bereavement. I called up the administrators of our FMLA and short-term disability plans to file my claim. I got the forms and figured out which which of my half dozen doctors had to fill out what. My orthopedist signed me off for 12 weeks of absence straight away because she noted I'd been in pain since May, so it would likely take a while to heal. After talking with her, my physical therapist, and my psychiatrist, I will likely be doing physical therapy for six weeks and then enroll in a program for anxiety and stress management for the remaining six weeks before returning. All covered by my insurance and all free because I may at my out-of-pocket maximum halfway through the year due to a hospital stay for a different medical issue. The night before I was due back, I sat there grinning while looking at the next morning's 8 a.m. calendar invite from Wanda. In her illiterate fashion, she had written, It's impotent! All crucial partners make every effort to attend this call! Like most of Wanda's obnoxiously illiterate declarations, it was a dig at me because I'd said in my last call with her and Pat that I might not be able to log on until 9 a.m. on the day I returned from leave. I opened a new window and typed out to my new manager, Dear Phil, I hate that this is our first introduction to each other, but while I was attending my mother's funeral, an ongoing medical issue resurfaced and I have to take medical leave immediately. I went on to inform him that I'd been hospitalized a couple of months back and there were other issues that were preventing me from returning to work, and he could get the details from my prior manager, Jim. Not that Jim paid a damn bit of attention to the emails I sent him detailing my doctor's visits, etc., even as he had moved on from being my manager because I still had to let him know about all my absences until I got a new manager. As things got worse at work, I became more clear in my details about my pain with typing getting worse hoping it might make Jim realize the situation was getting worse, but he never listened. So I sit here on a beautiful fall Friday morning, getting paid 100% of my salary to write this. Jim wasn't happy about my salary when I was working for him. I wonder how happy he is about my salary knowing I'm not having to work for it right now. When I return, I won't be on the two projects with upcoming releases. One will have already released, the other will release least less than four weeks after I come back. So they're screwed on that. I wonder if they figured out the test documents for November haven't been signed off yet. I was supposed to finalize them for sign off, but Pat forced me to prioritize Wanda's 2021 project over the November's work. So the test documents are still sitting locally on my work desktop untouched. I will also be returning with the requirement for accommodations, which I am now entitled to as I've learned I qualify for them under the ADA. No more telling me I have to work from home or hunch over a table in the break room if I want to be in the office. I'm working with an occupational therapy to draft up what those accommodations will be, but a height adjustable desk, 
Two large monitors and a distraction-free workplace are the top-line requirements. Meanwhile, my treatment plan includes exercise, trail walks, both regular therapy and physical therapy, and a weekly massage as well. I've added in long visits to the library to read all the books I've been wanting to catch up on, and nice lunches a couple of times a week to the mix. Several times throughout the day, I'll look at my watch while walking the trails with my dog, or just relaxing, and I smile broadly, thinking about Pat and Wanda, and Wanda's impotent project plan for 2021. Wonder what poor sod they've roped in to help her finish it now. I still may just quit right after I return, or they can just fire me. I'd be indifferent about that. But at least this way, I'll have milked 12 more weeks of pay out of these buttholes, while benefiting from all the free medical and emotional assistance my insurance plan can buy. They say living well is the best revenge, and I can't think of a company or group of people who deserve my pro-revenge more. Okay, first of all, uh, that was really well written, and I'm talking like technically, uh, good grammar and stuff like that. Um, second of all, uh, really, <laughs> really good revenge, and yeah, I agree. Uh, I like the more passive revenges, uh, like what she did, because yeah, I agree with that whole, just do well for yourself, and that's how you can get back at the haters, right? But I do sometimes get a bit of a justice boner if it's the perfect storm. <laughs> Is that appropriate? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.